Okay, welcome to the next episode in the ST3 uh, interview podcast series, um, focusing on the trauma and orthopedic ST3 interview. Um, I'm delighted to say today we're joined by um, Mr. Jamie Hind, who's currently an ST3 trauma and orthopedic registrar working in the Thames Valley Deanery. Um, how are you doing, Jamie? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. No, no problem. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the clinical station, which is a station that most people um, will find most interesting on the surface of it and put a lot of time into, but um, there's a certain technique and I'm sure a lot of people um, who've done the interview have found that we wanted to talk about and also about how the experience was in the new kind of virtual format that we've been doing. So I guess to kick off with Jamie, I wanted to ask you, how did you approach this station, you know, a year or so ago when you were coming up to the interview? Sure. Well, I think you, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like this is, uh, this is a different type of interview format to what anyone's used to before moving virtually. Um, and these sort of virtual interviews are not something that's taught to us. It's, it's a skill in itself. And I think that you know, for this, uh, for this interview, I think it's important to know that yes, they're going to test your knowledge, um, but, but they're also going to ask about, you know, like you need to know your sort of interview skills as well, how to approach an interview in an online, uh, online situation. Um, so, um, so I think providing that, you know, uh, for me, uh, giving myself plenty of time, uh, I think I set myself about four months to uh, cover the material that I wanted to cover for the, uh, for the interview, um, and also really rehearsing it and rehearsing it with all my friends and, uh, and setting up sort of uh, Zoom calls, uh, FaceTime sessions, so you can get used to talking to a camera as opposed to talking to someone in person, um, which I think was initially quite a difficult skill for me. Um, but through practice, I think I was getting better and better at doing it. And did, did you receive any advice from, um, you know, registrars in the region where you were working as to how to approach it or what, what did you go on? So in terms of for the clinical thing, I received uh, quite a lot of advice, actually, from a lot of the people that I was working with. Um, I was in the uh, West Midlands Deanery at the time and uh, I was working with a couple of the ST6s there. They were telling me advice on how they found the interview, what they found easy and what they found difficult. Um, and I was even able to set up sort of mock scenarios with them as well. Um, and, um, and they would give me some of the more difficult scenarios that they noticed um, um, at, at the time. And I guess talking through sort of the timeline of things. So the interviews kind of around about late March, early April-ish. Um, so you said you gave yourself about four months to revise for that. Um, when, when it came up to the interview itself, did you attend any courses or did you kind of stay away from courses? Did you find them helpful if you did attend courses? Yeah, I, I, I attended two courses, actually, and I think uh, that worked quite well for me. The first course that I attended was at the beginning of my um, sort of preparation, so about four months before. Um, and, um, and that was like a good introduction to the sort of the format, um, uh, how they'll be asking questions. They gave some good examples of different types of questions. Um, and, um, and it sort of like uh, gave me a good idea of what was expected of me. Um, I was then able to go ahead and do the revision, do the research, um, practice with my colleagues. And then I did another revision course a bit closer towards the, um, towards the date of the interview. Um, and um, it was nice to see sort of how I've come along. Um, it was nice to see how my confidence had improved. And it was also nice to also see other colleagues that were in a similar position to myself um, and, um, and, uh, and, and sort of like learn from their answers as well. There were some things that really resonated with me when I listened to my colleagues. Um, and I'm sure that there may have been some examples that I gave that, that my colleagues may have found quite useful. I see. OK. And, and I guess one of the key questions that a lot of people ask me and, and what I asked as well when I was at that stage was there's such a big breadth of you know, topic to cover with clinical scenarios. Um, do you go in depth with each scenario or do you just go to try and cover the breadth of it? How, how did you approach that? Sure. So, yeah, I think this was something I struggled with myself as well. And I think there's a lot of... Um, online resources that you can use, a lot of these question banks where they can go over all the topics. Um, and I think I used two or three of them. Um, and I noticed that they really do vary in how much detail they go into. Yeah. Uh, I think when you look at some of them that go into really niche topics and in very specific detail, it can be quite overwhelming. Um, but then there are others that really focus on the basics. Um, I think uh, one of my colleagues told me something that I found really useful and he was how he said, um, you know, have a good general knowledge of, um, of all of orthopedics, specifically going over all the BOST guidelines and making sure you know them well, as this really is what they're going to be testing you on. Yeah. Uh, and then there may be some niche questions that they do ask, which is why it's useful to go over some topics in more detail. 
Um, however, they really are just, just testing the breadth of orthopedic knowledge rather than the, the, the niche answers. So they're focusing on that sort of day one safe ST3 rather than when this person's ready for the FLCS exam. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and you've mentioned the, the, the BOSE guidelines. So, you know, however, 17, 18, probably more guidelines now. Mm. Did you read through all of them and try and memorize them all? Or did you pick the more kind of common ones that come up or how did you approach them? Yeah, so again, this was something that I was struggling with. I think um, I wanted to memorise them all. I wanted to know all of the BOSE guidelines uh, and I wanted to know how to manage all the patients appropriately. Um, I soon realised that a lot of the guidelines uh, do follow a similar pattern um, yeah. and really is about making the patient priority and safety first. And you didn't actually need to know the guidelines off by heart. You just needed to have a general understanding of the condition, um, the complications that can arise um, and um, and the sort of how to manage these patients. And, uh, and I found that it was quite it came across a lot easier than, than it sounds as to mem memorizing all the 17 or so uh, guidelines. Yeah. Um, but uh, but again, just through practice, hearing what other people were saying, um, you're not going to memorize it and they're not going to expect you to read it off. That would be the whole in the whole scenario. Yeah. And, and as you say, obviously, both guidelines, everyone knows they're kind of the number one things that they if there's anything they want you to hang your hat on, it's them. But some people also talk about learning or talking about key papers that are relating to certain management decisions. Was that something that you had a chance to talk about in the interview or was it, you know, quick fire and you didn't really get to that stage? Yeah, so again, this was something I revised um, and something that I was looking at. Um, I just quote the papers and also in the portfolio station as well, um, as research is something I was quite interested in. Yeah. Um, and um, again, I think it was just the understanding of having an, uh, like being aware of these papers, know, knowing um, what is important about these sort of key papers. Um, I, I wasn't actually in the position um, during the interview where they asked to quote any papers. I don't think I was expected to know them, uh, just yeah. more of an appreciation of them. OK, and so coming to the interview day itself, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've got three stations, 10 mm -hmm. minutes each, and it's just back to back with the same interviewers and members of the interview panel in the room. And you just go from one station to the other station just by with a you know, click of the fingers, really. So that obviously varies from the face to face format in that, you know, you, you don't really have any time to kind of get yourself into the clinical mode from, you know, having done your portfolio station or whatever. How did you find that switch into, you know, the clinical station? Yeah, I thought that was quite difficult, actually. And this was something I hadn't prepared for and I wish I did. However, I think the resources available were quite scarce. Um, so um, so when I started the interview, there was one person that I was faced with. And this was um, more of like an orchestrator rather than an actual examiner asking me questions. Yeah. And then each of the three stations was a separate examiner. So I had three individual people asking me about each of the stations. And as you said, it went from one to the other to the other very swiftly. There wasn't a break in between. Yeah. It was questions on my portfolio, questions on the clinical station, um, and then straight away questions on to um, the prioritization as well. Um, it was quite difficult to revise for it, considering I didn't know the, the exact way that they would interview these questions. However, yeah. once again, the best practice that, or well, the best thing that I did was practicing with friends. Um, and again, in these sort of online virtual platforms, um, setting up a group discussion, asking each other questions. Um, and we sort of made it um, towards the end as we were getting more familiar with the different questions. We were making it as if it was an interview scenario. So we were going through each of the different uh, yeah. uh, sort of stations um, in order as well, as if it was an interview. So really making a mock interview out of it. Yeah. And in the actual clinical station itself, it's 10 minutes. Did you just get one scenario? Was it two scenarios? Were they just expecting you to speak after they tell you a scenario? Or did they give you sort of questions about, you know, tell me the course of this nerve or that nerve? Or how did it really work? Well, so, um, so in my case, it was two scenarios, um, two scenarios to cover in 10 minutes. And I found that the first question that they asked in both scenarios was quite a general question question um, a very open question and a question that um, perhaps people may um, have, have quite long answers to and I think uh, I think that it's important to sort of um, cover cover what you're wanting to say uh, quickly and efficiently um, and then having like a power statement to close to know that, that let the examiner know that you finished that question so that they have enough time to ask you all the questions in the scenario 
Um, I've not seen a mark scheme, so I don't know how they are marked. Um, but um, but I assume that they would want you to try to talk through the whole of the station, asking all the questions in order to get maximum marks. Um, and surgery still remains a very competitive specialty. And I think in order to optimize a score, it's important to answer all the questions. But again, I don't know. I didn't have the marks. Sure. So was, they gave you that scenario and then you just talk for that five minutes, hopefully saying all the relevant points. And then you've got that statement to close and say, you know, I've come to the end of the scenario and then they move on to the next scenario, essentially. Yeah, so I think there was probably, yeah, the first station, first question was a um, quite broad question, but then they started asking more specifics on it. So there's probably about four questions, five questions okay. for the first scenario and the second scenario, again, about the same. Okay, and were those two scenarios linked, related? Was it the same kind of patient as they go through the journey or was it completely separate? No, yeah, it was completely separate. Two completely separate scenarios um, and, um, and then, yeah, completely different questions fo that followed it as well. Okay, and I guess... Uh, as I say, chose, we are mostly used to dealing with trauma on calls and on the ward. We don't really get as much exposure to elective practice, but there are the odd sort of elective questions that can crop up in the ST3 interview. Do you know any of your friends who had questions regarding elective orthopedics, or is it mostly just trauma and both guidelines and so on? Yeah, so. Um... So from the discussions we had afterwards, they were all trauma based. Um, okay. I'm all my friend. I say all my friends. I think there was probably about six of us that sat it on the same day uh, yeah. or the day after. Um, they were all trauma based. I don't think anyone had anything to do with elective. Um, but that, I don't know whether there were any elective questions or not. I haven't sort of reviewed or looked at what questions were asked last year. OK, fine. And you said that obviously the most useful way to practice this station was sitting down with friends. You, you didn't have the opportunity to do any virtual practice as such. And were these were you, practice you did, were they always with friends or were they with, with consultancy departments and other departments that you, you didn't know? Sure, yeah. So um, it was when in the workplace, it was uh, sort of face to face with my with my colleagues. There was consultants. There were um, uh, SHOs that would ask me questions. I was very fortunate. I had uh, another um, colleague of mine who was also applying for SD3 in orthopedics. Um, so we we're almost asking each other questions. And that was really useful. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, most of it was actually done virtually. Most of it was done when I went to, uh, when I was when I was at home. Um, on a virtual platform I think we use Teams quite a lot or, 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 um, or yeah. Facebook and um, uh, asking questions on this online platform and the reason why was because we wanted to get used to talking and making sure that the Wi-Fi was good and all these other yeah. really important aspects that I think as I said you know online interview is a skill in itself that's not taught and you need to teach yourself it. What, what do you think um, is the biggest mistake that people make when doing the clinical station? Um, so I think that what I highlighted earlier, I think there are some people that take it into a too broader context and just focus on both guidelines and just focus on big um, open topics. And I think the other side of it is there are some people that focus on more of the minute, um, intricate details of it. And I think that the clinical scenarios that I had, what my colleagues had and what everyone I know had were not unheard scenarios. They were, I think they were all appropriate and I think they were all um, uh, prepared for, like everyone prepared yeah. for them. Um, and I think it's having an understanding that this is how the questions will come, that, you know, it will be a topic that, you know, you should be able to discuss it. Your revision would have prepared you well for it. Um, and just being able to be confident in your answers, um, make sure that you have enough time to finish your answers and ask, wait for the next question. Um, and it does lead you down a certain path. Um, but generally speaking, I found that they, they do help you go down that path. They go down that path with you in their questions. Um, and if you are to go too off topic, then they might sort of interrupt you. Um, I didn't have this myself, but they might interrupt you to make sure that you do continue down the right path. Okay. Okay. So they're on your side. I'd, I'd like to think so. <laughs> um, I think what I want to talk about is one thing that I struggled with, and I know some other people do as well. You used to, be, as an SHO, saying that I will escalate to my registrar. But in this interview, you are supposed to be the registrar. Mm. And the person you're going to escalate to is your consultant. Mm. How do you get that balance right of not being the annoying ST3 who constantly calls your consultant for everything because it's your first day on the job versus... Mm you know, not trying to be too, um, you know, gung-ho and doing everything yourself and calling the consultant appropriately. How, how do you get that balance right? Sure. So again, it's a, it's a difficult, um, it's a difficult question really. And I don't know if there is an exact right answer for it. I think that, you know, I think uh, some of the SHOs that, uh, 
So I was again applying for orthopedic SD3. So um, a lot of the SHOs that will be applying for orthopedics probably would have been an orthopedic SHO. In district general hospitals, a lot of the time you are the, the, the point of contact, you are the point of call, you're the bleep holder. And through the night, you know, you need to make these decisions whether it's appropriate to wake up a senior um, or contact a senior um, and escalate things appropriately. Um, I think that um, the discussions that you have with the seniors is helpful. Um, but I think it's also gut instinct. You know whether you um, are, you know what your limitations are, you know what your capabilities are. Um, you are will be applying for an SD3. You'll be expected to be like, your answers will be as an SD3. But the difference between SD3 and this, the core surgical trainees is not as big a gap as people think. You know, if I contact someone for help, now um, as an SD3 I would have contacted them as a CT or vice versa so the things that I would have escalated as a CT um, I'll probably still escalate now um, so I don't think there's a huge gap we are expected to be the registrar um, but we're expected more importantly to be safe and if contacting the registrar means that you're being safe then I would say say you're contacting the super, superior person. Okay so it's having that focus on safety essentially whatever scenario you're in yeah I guess it, it's never going to be the wrong answer if you truly don't know how to manage something or you need help for it then it always it's always going to be the same thing to call someone or be yeah. it, whether they find it annoying or not in real life yeah yeah and, and i guess you you mentioned that you worked in the dgh you were the bleep holder overnight and um, having to make decisions about whether to contact the um, registrar and mm. um, some people would have only ever worked in trauma centers like me for example and applied for a sd3 and maybe not had that experience because i always had a registrar with me on the night shift when i was an sho mm. um did you find any difference or did you find that actually your experience in the dgh really you know helped you for a station or conversely in the trauma center you got exposure to these open fractures and things that really helped you manage yeah um so I think, I mean, I think ideally everyone would like to have a balance of both so they can see it through the eyes of both people, um, someone with senior support available to them um, and someone perhaps that would be, you know, the, the bleep holder through the night. Um, the, I, th I think that, in, I think the both guidelines do explain it well, and I don't mean to go back on them, but, um, but they really do provide a really good understanding of um, yeah. what is expected. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you are in a DGH or in a, a trauma center, the guidelines are for everyone. Um, and it makes it quite clear when to escalate and sort of you know what things to look out for. Yeah. Um, and um, perhaps uh, perhaps being in a district general hospital, it may be more beneficial because um, you, you'll be more inclined to con pick up a phone to contact a senior where then perhaps a major trauma center when you've had these situations before, you haven't had to pick up the phone to contact a yeah. senior because there's been a senior there. So people have come in under your admission, um, but yet you haven't had to escalate things because a registrar or a senior has been there to escalate for if necessary. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, so I do think it's difficult. I don't think it's necessarily a misfortune. I just think, uh, I think that, um, I think that uh, the guidelines communicating with seniors um, and, um, and, interview perhaps with colleagues is a good way to sort of come up with an understanding of what is expected as you uh, from you yeah no I think that's important as well because because I'd already ever worked in a trauma center when I came to the interview all the scenarios I assumed just automatically in my head that I was in a trauma center so I'd say I'd contact this specialty in plastics and they're, they're all expecting them all to be around and then yeah you know sometimes you can get caught out especially in practices when they say we're well, in you know, a you know, district general hospital, you don't have plastics, you don't have these people over here. So it was just kind of getting my head around that, having to clarify where exactly I am when, when you're dealing with these patients, which, um, you know, was a, took, took a bit of time for me anyway. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's important, actually, because I think they also will tell you what, which hospital you are in. Yeah. Um, as you said, if it is a major trauma, if it's a poly trauma, or if it's an open fracture, um, if it's a lot of conditions that are managed according to those guidelines, then, then they'll say you are in a major trauma centre. Yeah. Um, and your answers as well and say like i'm in a major trauma center i have my registrar i can contact them for advice or anything like that and just use it to your advantage i guess looking back at your interview obviously you were successful um so you must have done well over your whole interview is there anything you would have done differently for the clinical station in particular in terms of preparation so um what i came to realize is um i i I feel like for this particular interview, I prepared myself well, and um, and I feel that the interview went went well as well. Um, after the clinical stations, uh, I I was disappointed in my answers. Um, I had prepared 
well when I, I knew what I wanted to say for each of the scenarios that came up the two scenarios I had I had revised well, well with um, and uh, yeah I should have been prepared the answers I gave were not quite the answers that I was hoping to give mm-hmm. uh, and I, I left really deflated and really disappointed um, and um, yeah I was, I was really upset with how the interview went um, but I guess that you know because I was prepared because I did put in the time I did put in the effort and uh, I think I revised well um, even though it was the album, you know, it wasn't didn't go quite as well as I hoped. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was, as you said, I still was able to sc- score reasonably well and get the job that I wanted. Um, so I think go into this as prepared as you can be. Um, I think you know three to four months is is a sufficient amount of time to be really prepared for this interview. Yeah. Um, and um, if you are prepared, you 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 still may end up a little bit disappointed with your answers, um, but but you still will probably end up with a very good score um, just because you didn't say one or two things that you're hoping to say for the perfect score. So basically be so prepared that even if you have a, a bad day, so to speak, and you're still more than good enough to, to yeah. you know, get, get the job that you want. Yeah. Fine. And I, I would echo that as well. I think it's, it's not an interview, it's an exam, which lots of people have said that, you know, just like you advise for your MRCS or, you know, any other exam in medical school, I just treat it like that is what, what I was told anyway, continuously. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess coming to my final question now, what's what's the single best piece of advice that you can think of for people who are applying this year, knowing what you know from this virtual interview format and how the clinical station is? Sure. So um, from a, a general point of view, from the online point of view, I'd say um, practice, use the online platform and try and set yourself above from, from the rest. Use a high quality video camera don't use the webcam on the laptop if it's poor quality like this one maybe um, you can use external lighting and microphone it really makes you stand out makes you pop more um, makes you sound clear as well from the clinical stations use all the resources available because then you get a good breadth of what people are expecting and what people are advising so don't be afraid to use one or more question banks don't worry if you don't finish all the question banks um, use the podcasts that are available, use the courses that are available. You can use some textbooks as well, just to have some um, textbook knowledge of things for further clarification. There's lots of resources available. You don't need to use, you know, like use all of them in great depth, yeah. uh, but, um, but just sort of uh, have a good overall understanding and uh, yeah, use them to fine tune your orthopedic knowledge. Fine. And you, you mentioned some resources. Uh, we don't get paid by anyone. So this is all for you. Are there any specific resources that you found extremely good? Um, so any ones that I found particularly good, um, it's probably a bit of a fence sitter. Not really. I think I used... Um, with one of my colleagues, I used, I don't even know what they're called. I think there's, I think there's three main ones that people mm-hmm. tend to use. Um, I think I used two of them. One was uh, maybe an ortho prep and the other yeah. one was ST3 something. It's I'm like not... ortho interview, ortho prep, and there's a whole host of them if you just... Yeah, I, I can't really remember what they were, but the two that I used, they were quite different. One was quite basic it came across and there was a few questions maybe 10 questions the other one was extremely in lots of detail yeah. um, and I was really shocked when I started reading it I did this complex one first the one that's in lots of detail first um, and was completely overwhelmed and then it wasn't until I was practicing and then started doing the other one that I realized that actually you know I might have got this and then combining that with the interview preps that I've done as well in terms of the courses that were available yeah. um, I think it was just a combination of all the resources that I used um, which wasn't exhaustful. I think it was like four or five. Yeah. Uh, but I think that that was enough to prepare me well, in addition to sort of my own uh, study during my leisure time and practicing using these online uh, online platforms. Oh, well, excellent. That's that's really useful. Thank you. Um, listen, if, unless there's anything else you want to give in terms of advice, I, I think we'll um, pull things to a close there. Um, what I do want to say is a massive thank you to um, Jane for giving up your time because I know it's going to be very useful for people, especially in this new format that, that we have um, with your experience that you've had. Um, so uh, thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. No, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks. No problem. Take care. Bye bye.